All right, so the final chapter of the Red Badge of Courage, chapter 22. You kind of feel like, you know, they're charging into an attack and, and Henry's leading it, carrying the flag. And how could this be the last chapter of the story? Does he die? You know, like those are the things I think about when I get to a chapter like this. Uh, and the book is so nearly done. The youth kept the bright flag in the front. He was waving his free arm in fast circles, screaming appeals, urging forward those who did not need to be urged. It seemed that the mob of blue men throwing themselves on this dangerous group of rifles was again suddenly wild with a spirit of selflessness. It looked as if the mob would merely succeed in becoming a great spread of dead men on the grass in front of the fence. But they were in a state of madness. Again, courage, madness. Um, I know I'm, I keep pausing and, and thinking about this, but what is, what is Crane saying here? Is courage madness? Can you be courageous? and human and civilized and intelligent at the same time? Is courage simply a, a insanity or an animalism? The youth thought of the bullets only as things that could prevent him from reaching the fence. There were quiet flashings of joy within him that he had such thoughts. He put forth all his strength. His eyesight was shaken by the effort of thought and muscle. He did not see anything except the smoke and the fire, but he knew that in it lay the old fence of an absent farmer, the fence protecting the hidden figures of the gray men. As the smoke rolled away, it revealed men who ran. Their bodies turned to send back bullets at the blue line. But behind one part of the fence, there was a determined group that made no movement. They were settled down firmly. A flag waved over them, and their rifles continued to fire. The youth centered his eyes upon that flag. Its possession would give great pride. He jumped crazily at it. He was determined that it should not escape if wild grass could seize it. His own flag was pointing toward the other. The blue men came to a sudden stop and fired their guns rapidly. The group in gray was broken by the fire, but it still fought. The men in blue rushed upon it. Among the gray was the flag bearer, who had been badly hurt by the last rain of bullets. Over his face was the look of death, but upon it were the hard lines of determined purpose. He held his precious flag close to him and was struggling to go the way that led to safety for it. The youth's friend, this is Wilson, of course, went over the fence in a single leap and made a jump at the flag. Pulling it free, he lifted up its red colors with a mad cry of victory, just as the flag bearer turned his dead face to the ground. There was some long grass. The youth rested in it, making the fen fence support his flag. His friend, full of joy and glory, holding his treasure with pride, came to him there. They sat side by side and praised each other. So Wilson stole the Confederate flag, probably the battle flag of Northern Virginia. And he's got that as sort of a prize, also showing his, his bravery um, in the combat. Finally, the youth rose. Well, now what, I wonder, he said. His friend also rose and stared. I think we're going to go back across the river, he said. They waited, watching. Within a little while, the regiment received orders to go back the way it had come. The men got up from the soft grass. They traveled slowly across the field through which they had run in their mad attack. The regiment marched until it joined the others. The brigade marched through a forest to the road. Soon they were in a mass of dust-covered troops. At this point, they all curved away from the field and went off in the direction of the river. The youth breathed a breath of new satisfaction. He finally touched his friend. Well, it's all over, he said to him. By God, it is. They thought about it. Gradually, the youth was able to more closely understand himself and what had happened. Do we, as readers, more closely understand him and what had happened? Let's see what he, what he concludes here. Um, this is the last chapter, so maybe we're at the resolution of the story. He understood that the shooting was in the past. He had been in a land of strange battle and had come through. He had been where there was red blood and black passion, and he had escaped. His first thoughts were the thoughts of joy at this fact, so he's happy that he's escaped alive. Later, he began to study his deeds, his failures, and his accomplishments. At last, his acts passed before him clearly. The youth felt happy and without guilt as he remembered for his public deeds were things of great and shining beauty. So publicly, uh, what he's done has, has been great and wonderful. Uh, his fleeing and all of that kind of stuff was private. Nobody else saw it. So again, very concerned with what other people think of him. It was a pleasure to think of these things. He realized that he was good. 
Nevertheless, the memory of his running from the first battle appeared to him. He thought with shame of the tattered soldier who, broken by bullets and losing blood, had worried about an imagined wound in the youth. The tattered soldier had given his last strength to Jim Conklin, and tired and hurt, he had been left alone in the field. For an instant, the youth's heart seemed frozen at the thought that his actions might be discovered. So it's, is he upset that he did these things or that these things might be found out? And, and does he have the maturity to separate those two? And for a time, the steady remembering of the tattered man took all joy from the youth. He saw his error always before him, and he was afraid it would stand before him all his life. So yeah, he's afraid the guilt is going to, to last forever, and it probably will. Um, but gradually he gathered strength to put the sin at a distance. Then he regarded it with what he thought was great calmness. It would become a part of him. He would have to live with the realization of a great mistake. And from it, he would learn to be gentle with others. He would be a man. Coming of age story? Um... His eyes were now open to new ways. He found that he could look back upon his earlier ideas of the glory of war and see them differently. He was glad when he discovered he now hated them. He had come from his struggles with a better understanding of the world. I think that's interesting, too. At the end of this, you know, he thought about the glory of war, and now he hates that ideal. Um, is it because there's no glory in war or because, you know, like what, what's going on here? With this recognition came a new assurance. He felt a quieter manliness, calm but strong and healthy. He faced the great death and found that, after all, it was only the great death. He was a man. It rained. The tired soldiers marched with effort through the brown mud under a low dark sky. Yet the youth smiled, for he saw that the world was a world for him. He had freed himself of the red sickness of battle. The awful dream was in the past. He had been an animal burned and wounded in the heat and pain of war. He turned now with a lover's desire to thoughts of calm skies, fresh meadows, cool brooks, an existence of soft and everlasting peace. Over the river, a golden ray of sun came through the masses of gray rain clouds. And that's the end. It's a nice, hopeful image at the end of the sunlight through the clouds. But let's analyze a couple of these last bits here. Um, he faced the great death and found that after all, it was only the great death. Eh, you know, death is the thing that he was afraid of. And it seems now that he's not afraid of it anymore. And this makes him more, more of a man and less of an animal. Animals are afraid of death. Men are not. I think that's that's maybe what's being said here. Then we have this nature imagery. It's raining. Um, you know, rain usually represents sorrow or sadness. And maybe on some level, because the army's in defeat, the rain sort of represents their defeat. They did not win the Battle of Chancellorsville. They're marching right back across the river to where they started at the beginning. So Henry's had this, this crazy journey, but the army has come no closer to winning the war. Um, but Henry himself is smiling uh, because he, he's more content with his place in the world. Um, maybe on some level he's learned to stop being so introspective. Uh, he also freed himself from the red sickness of battle, so he feels like he doesn't have to fight anymore. Um, and he says that awful dream was in the past. But here's the thing about Henry and about Crane, and Crane is clearly aware of what's going on here. Henry loves to come to strong conclusions about his own life. But in the past of the story, all of them have been wrong and he's changed them all over and over and over again. And he seems to think that, hey, battles in the past, the war is over. It's not. Uh, this army is going to go on to Gettysburg and then it's going to have to invade Virginia and have all kinds of battles on the way to Richmond and to Appomattox and to the surrender of the South. Henry is not done fighting. He seems to think that because he made it through this battle, that everything's cool, but it's not. And this war is not done. So, uh, <laughs> I don't, I don't know, you know, what, what as readers we're supposed to get out of this, except that Henry, this one guy is happy with his performance in this one war or this one battle, but the war is not over. Uh, 
he had been an animal. Here's the animalism coming back, burned and wounded in the heat of pain and war. Uh, but he's not an animal anymore. He's a man. We just saw that one paragraph before. He was a man. So there's a contrast betwo- between um, humanity and animalism. Uh, he turned now with a lover's desire to thoughts of calm skies, fresh meadows, cool brooks. So these are the imagery of nature that's positive imagery in contrast to the warfare. An existence of soft and everlasting peace. But he's still a soldier and the army is going to fight again. So he's definitely not leaving this battlefield to soft and everlasting peace um and then over the river a golden ray of sun came through the masses of gray masses of gray reminds you of the uh confederate army which is over the river uh, so you know it's, it's an ambiguous ending uh it just sort of ends and henry seems to have grown uh but you as a reader are left to decide whether he really has or not, whether this conclusion is like all of his other conclusions, sort of empty words, um, you know, momentary conclusions that he's taking to be permanent conclusions that he's just going to have to alter and change later, or whether he really has gone through some kind of a change. Uh, and, And we're left with his moral ambiguity. He ends on a high note being courageous and helping his forces, but he did these other things earlier. And so is he really heroic? Is heroism your action in one instance, or is it a sum of your actions over a long span of time? These are questions that Crane doesn't answer. And, and, it may be frustrating to you that Crane doesn't answer them, uh, especially if you're used to reading um, young adult fiction. And this is sort of a piece that is, is in a lot of ways, like young adult fiction. Um, young adult fiction often tells you what to believe. It creates situations in which characters are either good or evil, and in which you can feel comfortable rooting for one or the other. Uh, Henry is not that character. He's he's a, a real character human being, sort of a blend of good and evil, sort of a gray figure. He does things that are good. He does things that are that are reprehensible. And he comes to conclusions and, and you're not 100% sure whether you believe them. And, and Crane's ending is very much in keeping with the rest of the story. I often tell my students that good works of literature leave you with more questions than answers. Because even though authors are always trying to teach lessons and they're always uh, bringing you their view of the world and what wisdom they can out of it, it's the journey the reader makes in trying to answer the questions that the author leaves in the story that bring you sort of the wisdom and the knowledge of of literature. And I, I think The Red Badge of Courage is no exception in this case. So you'll have to come to your own conclusions. And part of the joy and struggle and frustration of writing a literary analysis paper is it is your job to convince me that your conclusions are right. So you have to find the evidence, you have to line it up, and you have to support it. Uh, I'm looking forward to your papers. Thank you for your time, and I hope you enjoyed the Red Badge of Courage.